Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and this video is completely unplanned. As I was using Universe Sandbox, I just discovered they had a new update where they introduced a new simulation known as the History of Saturn's Moons. Now I generally use this tool quite a lot to explain various things in space and of course space sciences and because of this I wanted to showcase what they've actually added talk a little bit more about it and also explore this with you as I actually haven't really tried it yet. At the same time this is a bit of a promotion for the Universe Sandbox because it's such an amazing tool to learn space sciences. Well anyway, it starts right here and here is their simulation of Saturn. As you probably know, Jupiter was always the kind of a leader in terms of the amount of moons that we've discovered and as of 2019 we've discovered 79 different moons around Jupiter so it's no surprise that because of its more massive size and because of its actual mass, we assume that Jupiter is probably going to stay as the leader forever. But it turns out that in 2019 we discovered, completely by accident, 20 new moons of Saturn, giving a total record now 82 moons. Now, because of this discovery, we also started thinking about, well, maybe it's time for us to reclassify moons as well. Maybe moons that we kind of think of as moons, and also the moons that we just recently discovered are not really the same object. Maybe we should classify them as something else. In one of the previous videos, I proposed that we name them dwarf moons, just like we did with dwarf planets, but it's probably going to take a while before we come up with a good term. But anyway, so here is the second image that we get to see in the Universe Sandbox, and it briefly tells us about the first discovery of Titan. Titan, as you may already know, is the moon of Saturn, but it's also one of the most interesting moons, if not the most interesting moons, in the solar system. Discovered in 1655 by the Dutch astronomer Christian Huygens, this beautiful moon contains very very thick atmosphere, as a matter of fact, with more atmospheric pressure than here on Earth. We've also detected a lot of really unusual activity here, we've detected things that might resemble actual life activity, suggesting that maybe there is some kind of a weird life going on here after all. It hasn't really been confirmed yet, but we've for example seen unusual patterns of methane that has not been explained just yet. And as you know, here on, on Earth, methane is usually associated with life. Here's by the way what Huygens may have looked like, and as you also know, the probe that landed on Titan and took amazing beautiful images and actually were later compiled into this beautiful video that you see, um, were named after him as well, so the Huygens probe is named after him. Then, a few decades later, between 1671 and 1684, we have a few more discoveries, this time from an Italian uh, astronomer working under the financial support from King Louis XIV of France. Now, back then, this is kind of how it worked. If you were a famous astronomer, or if you were any kind of a famous scientist, you would usually get some kind of a patronage, or basically financial support, from a kingdom or an empire, and this is how you would literally live your life. But what did the King Louis XIV get out of having this guy, Giovanni Cassini, working for him? Well, prestige, bragging rights, and the fact that Cassini was responsible for directing, building, and establishing the Paris Observatory that then became pretty famous afterwards. So this is kind of how things worked back then. Oh, and Cassini, by the way, discovered four more moons of Saturn. You can kind of see them right here. There's Tethys, um, Dione, Rhea, and the fourth one is right here, this is Iapetus. So he was able to discover them and he was obviously the first to do so. And because this was his biggest discovery and he was essentially the first to find these moons, the Cassini mission was obviously named after him, among a lot of other things around Saturn. And then 100 years or so passed and in 1789 it was William Herschel who discovered two more moons. We have the moon Mimas and the famous Enceladus, where we currently believe um, there might be life, or actually inside of which there might be life, because what we've seen on Enceladus is absolutely incredible. These beautiful geysers that emanate from the surface are very likely caused by an extremely active and also very energetic liquid ocean on the inside that's very likely driven by all sorts of volcanic activity that's coming from the inside. And all of this results in these beautiful emissions that are responsible for creating one of the rings of Saturn. It's known as the E-ring. Here's actually one of the images that was taken by the Cassini, and um, as it passed through these particles, it even got to kind of detect what's on the inside, and we've discovered a lot of really cool things. No life yet, but a lot of organic materials that could produce life. And the current models suggest that Enceladus may look something like this on the inside. This was made by NASA when all of this was discovered, so we think that there's a pretty thick layer of ice, then there is the liquid ocean, and then there is some kind of a rocky, um, very likely 
terrestrial core that's relatively small in size, but nevertheless is there and is responsible for all of this activity. And for all we know, on the actual surface of that rocky insides is maybe where we can find some unusual Enceladian life. Enceladian, that's a pretty cool word. Can't wait for us to actually discover this. But the thing is, uh, these moons were not named this until middle of 19th century, 1847. Specifically, it was actually um, Herschel's son, John Herschel, who proposed naming all of these moons not after kings or queens or any royalties, but after Greek mythological characters, specifically after the Greek Titans. So all of these were actually Titans in Greek mythology. And very shortly after, in the middle of 19th century, that's when a lot of astronomy started to kick in and people started to compete. So the eighth moon, Hyperion, was actually discovered by two separate teams. One of them was William Bond and his son George, but it was actually William Lassell who later published a paper about the discovery of Hyperion and uh, was technically credited as the discoverer of this moon. This friendly competition, of course, created a lot of opportunities for astronomers to now start discovering and naming new things, and the middle of 19th century is when we started to get a lot of new data coming from various objects in the solar system. Then, in 1899, we discovered an unusual moon known as Phoebe. But this moon was not discovered by looking at it directly through the telescope, it was actually discovered in a photographic plate that was taken a year before that. And interestingly, this moon is what's known as the irregular moon of Saturn. Uh, this moon uh, moves in the opposite direction. It also may have come as a kind of a captured object, so it was probably an asteroid before, and very likely it did not form as other moons that were there from the beginning of Saturn's life. Here in the simulation, you can even see that Phoebe moves clockwise, while every other moon of Saturn actually moves in the opposite direction. They all move counterclockwise. And this is typical of these irregular moons. The new moons discovered around Jupiter and the new moons discovered around Saturn, they're all irregular moons that have very similar unusual patterns, suggesting that all of them were a result of a capture later on in the existence of both planets. And then we come into the 20th century. This is where all of the other discoveries happened. And the first uh, discovery was in 1966, and this was an astronomer known as Adwin Dolfos. I had to read this, it's, his name is pretty complicated. He discovered uh, this moon right here, this is known as Janus. And um, only a few days later, another astronomer, Richard Walker, also seems to have seen it in a very similar orbit. But there was an unusual anomaly in their observation, because the orbits seem to have been a little bit different. And it took a while, it actually took a few years, specifically 12 years, for us to realize that they were looking at two different moons that had the same orbit but were actually in the Lagrange point of each other. So Janus is right here, but the second moon, Epimetheus, is on the opposite side. So they basically are in a relatively similar orbit, but they are on the opposite side of Saturn and never get to see each other. And then in 1980, we started discovering more unusual moons. Here we have Helene, Telesto and Calypso, all three of which are what's known as Trojan moons. They are also in the Lagrange points. By the way, here's a quick reminder of what Lagrange points are. In every orbit around a more massive object, the smaller object will have these really stable permanent orbital points where you can have things staying in there and not really falling into either object. These uh, points are known as Lagrange points. The most famous one is probably L1 and L2. This is where we place a lot of satellites to observe either the Sun or Earth. We also obviously have L3, which is the opposite side, but then we have these two points, L4 and L5. And usually if you find any kind of an object, like for example an asteroid or a smaller planetoid orbiting there, we normally refer to them as Trojans. Jupiter, for example, is so massive that it's believed to have thousands if not millions of different Trojans, many of which have already been discovered and many of which are just too small for us to see. And so, obviously, it shouldn't really come as a surprise that um, Saturn also has these Trojans, but I guess what is surprising is that they're Trojans of the moons of Saturn. Specifically here, you can kind of see that this moon right here, Telesto and Calypso, are the Trojans of the larger moon Tethys, and Helena here is the Trojan of the moon Dione. So, they're all located in a kind of a 60 degree angle um, known as the Lagrange point. Specifically here, because these moons are in these positions, they're going to be in a really stable orbit around Saturn for a, a pretty long time. 
Then the arrival of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes um, discovered a few more moons and here all of them were actually inside the rings of uh, Saturn. We have Pandora, Atlas and Prometheus. While at the same time, the Voyager probes also confirmed the discoveries of all of the previous moons as well. Then, interestingly, about 10 years later, we've also discovered, completely by accident by the way, the moon known as Pan. This was such a small moon that it was really, really difficult to see it, but we saw it in one of the pictures taken by the Voyager 2 probe. Here is what it sort of looks like. You can see that it's barely even visible um, between the rings of Saturn. And it also became really, really popular because it turns out that it's shaped like a ravioli. Uh, a few moons of Saturn do have this unusual shape. And later on, we realized that all of this is a result of a really complex interaction between the moon itself and the rings of Saturn as they deposit around the moon and create these really unusual, really interesting shapes. Here are the pictures taken by the Cassini, um, and you can see that the moon looks really unusual. But it also suggests that many smaller moons, specifically moons orbiting around rings, may start this way and eventually become bigger and bigger, turn spherical, and might end up looking more like the moons we know today. So this could be what an embryo or a baby moon looks like. And then, in the beginning of the new century, in 2001, we discovered a lot of other irregular moons. You can kind of see all of them here. And um, all of this came as no surprise because we've always believed they existed there, we just didn't really know how to look for them and also how many there are. And it's very likely we haven't even found a fraction of them yet. It's very possible that there are thousands and maybe millions and who knows, maybe even more tiny moons out there. Here are some more moons discovered in 2005. All of these were also irregular moons of Saturn, but the most important discoveries uh, were actually done between 2004 and 2009, when the Cassini mission discovered some of the uh, inner moons as well. The most interesting discovery was actually this right here. It doesn't really have a name just yet, but the interesting thing about it is how it was discovered. It was by looking at the images of Saturn's rings and seeing this unusual shadow that the moon formed by passing essentially above the ring is how we were able to actually see it. It's so tiny that it would be impossible to see it in any other way. The moon itself is only about a thousand feet or 300 meters in diameter, but the shadow that it created was about 36 kilometers large. So that's basically how we were able to see it. Even though at this point it's, I guess, a little bit difficult to see, is this really a moon or is this just a chunk of matter inside the ring? And at the same time, this is where we kind of need to start thinking about, so what exactly is a moon and what exactly would be just a particle in the Saturn's ring? How do we start differentiating one from another? Then, in 2006, a famous astronomer, Scott Shepard, announced the discovery of several more moons, specifically nine more moons, but this was done with a ground telescope, the Subaru telescope. And this is what this beautiful Subaru telescope looks like. This is in Hawaii, on top of a mountain, just under 14,000 feet in the air, or about 4 kilometers up. Basically, it's on top of a very, very high mountain. And because of its um, very large mirror, and also because of the design and the location, it's able to very easily see the night skies, and this is how it was able to discover those moons we haven't seen before. At the same time, this is also the primary telescope right now that we're using to try to discover Planet 9, if it exists. We're hoping to find it within the next five years, but even if it doesn't exist, we'll probably still see a lot of other things we didn't really expect to find. Then in 2007 we saw three more moons, but here unfortunately for um, two of them we didn't really calculate their orbits too accurately because it was very difficult to see them, and so they were considered to be lost. And so two of them, this one here and also that one right there, were technically lost until very recently. And it was only in 2019 that we finally rediscovered where this moon was. However, this right here is still technically considered to be the lost moon of Saturn because we're not sure what its actual orbit is. And lastly, in 2019, this is when Scott Shepard again discovered 20 more moons, irregular moons of Saturn, using the same Subaru telescope. But unfortunately, five of these moons are considered to be the so-called lost moons because their orbits are not precisely known. You may want to check out the video I made previously where I do talk a little bit more about um, the discovery and also the competition that NASA is running to try to name these moons. But in a nutshell, this is what the 82 moons of Saturn are and this is how we discovered them and then this is how essentially the astronomy progressed since the early 1600s. Now honestly, it's a pretty exciting time to live in because the technology has reached the point where we can easily see these objects in the night skies using very, very complicated techniques and using a lot of really complex analysis 
We can even predict where certain moons could be, and then possibly find them there. This is essentially how we're looking for Planet 9, of course by using a combination of observation and prediction. Now we don't really know what else we'll discover around Saturn in the next few years, but it's probably going to be even more moons and very likely moons that were previously lost will be rediscovered and their orbits will be more specifically determined. For now, the exciting part about all of this is of course trying to um, find a way for us to get back to the inner Saturn system and to hopefully launch a successful mission to first Titan, but also Enceladus. Now the mission to Titan is already being planned, that NASA mission is currently known as the Dragonfly, but we still are yet to decide if we're going back to Enceladus and if we're going to try to reach the ocean of Enceladus, and if so, how. Nevertheless, very exciting times to live in, hopefully in the next decade or so we'll get a lot more discoveries coming in from this beautiful system, and hopefully we'll get to make some incredible discoveries right here on Titan as well. And this is definitely one object I would love to learn more about. But anyway, on that note, that's all I wanted to mention. Check out Universe Sandbox, um, it's somewhere in the link in the description. It's an amazing educational tool and I've used it for many years. But also, as you may notice, I'm wearing an unusual t-shirt. Here's what it sort of looks like in more detail. This is the poster and the t-shirt I ordered very recently just to see the quality because I didn't really want to collaborate with a company that's not going to produce high quality merchandise. And the company making these t-shirts, Teespring, promised me that their customer service is going to be stellar. I actually asked them to possibly replace one of the products just to see if it works and they were absolutely fine doing so. So if you like this design and you want to feel like the wonderful person that you are, the link for this is also in the description below. But for now, as you can see, I have a poster on my door and every time I walk into the room where I usually work, it makes me feel like a wonderful person. And honestly, not all of you enjoy being called a wonderful person, as I've noticed from some of the comments that I get, but because it's a catchphrase that has caught up to me over the years, I decided to go with it. Anyway, in some of the future videos, we'll talk more about Saturn, especially when we discovered something new. For now, that's it. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you still haven't. Share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences and come back tomorrow to learn something else. I'll see you tomorrow. Space out and as always, bye-bye.